Hey everybody, good afternoon, I think it is. Chris Grandy, playing with Chris.com, ChrisGrandy.com, Walnut Hill Advisors. Got my Hawaii shirt on today and um, my rain spooner. Uh, pop one of the older brands of, you know, uh, Hawaii shirts, the Aloha shirts. Uh, make a nice, comfortable t-shirt, too, I have to say that. I wanted, today I want to talk about the, um, the uh, SECURE Act, which just passed the House and by like 400 to 17 or something. And it, uh, it's, the Senate is sponsoring the exact same bill with no word changes. It's going to pass. So I thought this is going to apply to you or your parents. So let's, let's go through these items real quick. So what I thought I would do is summarize it for you. And I'm using some of the summary from uh, Richard Neal, who's a congressman from Massachusetts, is the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee. I believe he's the sponsor, the primary sponsor of this bill. And um, he has a summary of the bill. So I'm going to go through that and then just talk about some of the points, maybe try to make, make them into something more, uh, more easy to understand, although the summary is pretty good, too. All right. So um, first thing, there's, there's a bunch of sections in this, uh, in this bill. But their Title I, first section, they're going to expand and preserve retirement savings. What they're going to do um, is loosen a couple of the requirements on the employer side. They're going to make um, safe harbor rules easier. So safe harbor is a thing where if you make a, if a company makes a contribution to the employee's retirement plan, a certain percentage, like 3%, um, then if the upper income, upper level employees contribute a lot of money, it won't, the plan won't be considered uh, top heavy. It'll still be in compliance. So as long as the company made a minimum contribution for all employees, then there would be uh, fewer or no restrictions on um, upper income, higher level employees contributing a lot. And what they did was they just made those simpler and easier for people to understand. So um, eliminating some notice requirements, et cetera. They've also, um, made it easier and expanded the credits when a small company starts a retirement plan. So if you are thinking of starting a retirement plan, there was formerly a, you know, they would give you a tax credit for that one time. Um, now they're going to expand and make it easier. Um, don't need to go through all the details, but they're just trying to make more incentivize uh, retirement plans across the, uh, across the marketplace, especially for small companies that don't have them. So they're increasing that. They're also giving a tax credit for those who automatically enroll employees, um, an automatic enrollment credit. So those are the first four sections. We're basically simplifying um, the 401k process, et cetera, making, and giving, making the tax credits also simpler for putting these plans in place for your employees. So FYI, if you happen to run a small company. All right. Uh, and then next section they're doing is 105 is they're going to allow certain uh, non-tuition fellowship and stipend payments to be considered compensation. So in other words, uh, you might be a graduate student and you're earning um, some fellowship. You're, you've got a fellowship uh, or you're getting a stipend and it wasn't previously considered uh, earned income for taxable purposes. So you couldn't use that income to contribute to an IRA uh, for the basis of that because in order to, in order to contribute to an IRA, you have to have earned income, okay, and let's say you're under age 50 and you want to contribute the maximum $6,000 to an IRA, you'd have to have at least $6,000 of income. So if you have $3,000 of income, you can contribute $3,000 to an IRA. If you have $6,000 of income, you can contribute $6,000. If you have $20,000 of income, you can contribute $6,000. So that was the rule. But certain people in, in the university environments were working in places and they were not getting... Um, and the income they're earning was not considered taxable income, not IRA income. They've, um, they've uh, now they're going to treat certain um, non-tuition uh, income as compensation for IRA purposes to allow those people to contribute to IRA. So, hey, there you go. Grad students get a little bit of a break. You can paid a very low salary for the work you do, but <laughs> try to give you a little bit of a tax break. Um, repeal of maximum age for traditional IRA contributions. So, in other words... Um, once you hit age set previously, once you hit age 70 or currently until they change this, once you hit age 70, you can no longer contribute to, uh, to an IRA. They're going to eliminate that cap. So if you're working and you're 75, you can contribute. All right. Um, their next section, they're going to eliminate the ability for 401k loans to be made through credit cards and other easy to use 
processes. So kind of defeats the purpose if um, if you make it as easy as a credit card, right? You've got 100000 in the 401k, you need to borrow from it for whatever reason, you know, times are tight, whatever. You borrow 20000 they give you a credit card. I mean, that can get abused pretty easily. I mean, I have to imagine if instead you took the loan out, 20000 put it in your bank, and you had it there, you might be a little more careful with it. So they're going to eliminate the uh, ability of these 401k providers to offer credit cards or things like that uh, just to make sure they're not used for routine small purchases. Again, when it's in the credit card, it's not going to be used for emergencies likely. You're probably going to just go to the store with it or something. Um, so that, that makes sense to me. Uh, portability of lifetime income options. They're also, um, um, I won't get into all the details on this, but they're also going to expand and make easier the use of annuities inside retirement plans. So they've moved towards this over the last few years with these qualified longevity annuities. And, but what they're trying to do is they want more people and you know, again, the, the thought, the research and the thought pro and, and the thought leaders kind of behind this, you know, as pensions have gone away, um, there is more of a need for, and in 401ks increase, there's more of a need for security. And some people just don't like the instability and don't want the, the financial risk of having, you know, their 401k bounce around while they're retired. I mean, it's understandable, you know. I mean, consider the years of a pension. You graduate, you uh, graduate, you, you uh, retire from uh, a stable American company at age 65, and they say we're in, excuse me for itching my nose, I don't know if it was spider web on my nose or something. Uh, you know, they say you retire for 65 and you can get X amount of dollars a year, a month for the rest of your life. And you know what? The company has to provide it. It's guaranteed, plus that pension's insured by the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, the PBGC. And you don't think about it. The market's up or down. The money behind that pension doesn't matter. You're not worried day to day if you're managing the money correctly, et cetera. And if they're short, the company has to make up the difference with cash flow. And if the company went out of business, the PBGC, PBGC backs you up to a certain amount. So. That's a lot different than saying, here's a pile of money in your 401k, and um, it's up to you to manage. Don't spend it too fast. And a lot of people, that's kind of uncomfortable. So they're making, making it easier to do annuities inside the plans. What you basically would do is you would, uh, let's say you had $700,000 in your 401k plan. Maybe you would take a couple hundred thousand dollars and convert that to an annuity. So you'd have sort of a pension for some of the money, because that's really all, all that a pension is, is an annuity. Okay, the, the generic term of annuity is a stream of payments. Okay, it's not the product you get from an insurance company. It's just the generic term is a stream of payments. So maybe you would take $200,000 of your 401k balance, convert that to an annuity, and you're collecting income for life. And the rest of it can bounce around with the market. But you've got a little bit of, like I've talked about before, that we've talked about in, uh, where I come from, floor plus upside, which is you, you create a floor of income, this monthly income coming in every month, guaranteed by somebody and then you have upside you still have money invested for inflation for future needs for other goals so they're they're working on that okay um what else we got here clarification of retirement income church controlled organizations they've been clarifying some 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 pieces of information when it comes to retirement plans and 403bs and nonprofits like churches they're going to allow long-term part-time workers to participate in 401k plans. So before, if an employer, um, when, you, when you have a plan and you kind of say, okay, here are the plan rules, and they're in place, you know, and there might be a, a plan rule that says, you know what, we're going to uh, effectively eliminate, you know, anybody who doesn't, there are some things you can eliminate or certain um, workers from participating. And those are people that work mainly part-time, you know, less than 1,000 hours a year. Um, those are people that, um, um, you know, may haven't worked with you for more than two years. There's different types of things you can do to, to restrict participation in the plan. And the reason you restrict that is because you do have to maintain this thing. And maintenance gets kind of overwhelming if you have a lot of people in and out. Someone comes to work for you for eight months, leaves. You have all these people all over the place. It's a lot of uh, expense for the company and aggravation. But let's say you do have a long-term part-time employee and the rules just limit that person from being able to contribute. They're going to add flexibility where instead of the thousand hour rule, three years where the employee completes at least 500 hours of service, they could be eligible for the plan. So they're making the uh, eligibility of 401k more flexible. All right. 
Uh, they're going to increase, this is a big one, this is what's making all, a lot of the headlines. They're going to increase the RMD age, so the age which you have to start taking money out of your retirement plan. It was 70 and a half, that ridiculous half age number. They're going to make it 72. All right, so there you go. Okay, tax exempt income and care payments be treated as compensation for purposes of COVID. So again, they're going to uh, do the same thing kind of they're kind of doing with um, with education people is that they're making certain income for care payments uh, part of the compensation so they, those can contribute to retirement plans. Okay, uh, making some flexibility in, um, uh, in the start date of retirement plans when people adopt those plans. They're going to allow kind of combined group plans for 401k. So if a bunch of small employers want to have a, gr uh, a grouped 401k, they can combine the annual reports. Um, they're adding some safe harbor provisions. So they're giving a little bit more um, leeway to plans that offer these annuities. Again, a few more lines about that. Uh, you know, obviously, when you add a new law, there's a bunch of old laws, and you might contradict it a little bit. So they're just trying to clarify that situation. Um, let's see here. Non-discrimination, old benefits from volunteer firefighters. Uh, expansion of another another pretty good uh, planning provision that might apply to lots of people as opposed to a few people. Uh, Five twenty nine accounts you can uh, take up to ten thousand dollars uh, to pay for qualified student loan repayments. All right, so there was some um, um, and private elementary, secondary, religious schools. So there was some some restrictions on exactly what you can pay. Like you're supposed to pay tuition. Um, so if you you know, just took out loans, and then later on, you know, you wanted to pay the 529, you wanted to pay the, the loans off with 529 money, this makes it official that you can take $10,000 out and do that. All right. One other part of this that's affecting um, beneficiaries and, and estate planning is that um, if the beneficiary is not your child, but is a minor, so in other words, it's not, uh, the beneficiary is not a surviving spouse, a disabled or chronically ill individual, individuals who are not more than 10 years younger, or the child of the employee who has not reached the age of majority, are generally required to be distributed in the 10th year. So they're not going to let, this is the stretch IRA. They're not going to allow the stretch IRA anymore for certain beneficiaries. They're going to require the money be paid out in 10 years. So another reason just to check who your beneficiaries are, if it's not your spouse and such, um, just double check that, okay? That's an important part. So they do have, um, they did, are increasing the penalty for failing to file um, your tax return, all right? And they're making, well, I'm making them a lot bigger. So that's something to look out for too. Those of you that might habitually file late, <laughs> okay? Um, let's look out for that. So those are some of the things, probably house keying they want to clean up. Maybe the IRS told them, hey, listen, there's a lot of people just, kind of jerking around with this stuff. Uh, so they're addressing that too. Those, have, you would think those have nothing to do with the SECURE Act. You know, this is the SECURE Act, supposed to be securing retirement. Throw a couple things on the end of increasing penalties. Don't look at those, that's more important. <laughs> they, they don't want you to look at that stuff. It's in there, but they don't want you to know they're increasing penalties. But the important things are the RMD extension, that's gonna apply to, you know, everybody who's alive and has an IRA. The 529 plan would apply to you know the millions of people that have 529s. Um, the you know thousands of grad students will will might be able to benefit from the expansion of of um, earned income to stipends and certain um, um, you know fees they get at school. What's interesting too, remember I mentioned this in another video, but remember if your child is say a graduate student and they're earning twenty thousand dollars a year, so let's say they get free room and board and they earn twenty thousand dollars a year from the school. And, and then, you know, they're okay because, they, you know, they got the free room and board, they're living okay. And now let's say some of that compensation, which was previously not allowed to be considered IRA contribution, IRA contribution compensation, is now um, permitted to be, uh, you know, includable compensation to do IRAs. Remember, even if they can't afford to do the IRA, if you wanted to help them fund their IRA, as long as they have the earned income, you can put money in their IRA for them. So, the law doesn't say that the $6,000 you earn or the $3,000 you earn has to go into the IRA. It just says if you earn $3,000, then you can put $3,000 in the IRA it could come from anywhere. Okay, you just, have to, you just have to have earned income. You cannot do an IRA unless you have earned income. 
but it doesn't have to be that exact income. It doesn't have to go right from your paycheck to the IRA. You can spend all that money and then your mom can give you 3000 for your IRA. So if some of you want to make sure your kids get a little bit of a head start, or if you're doing intergenerational family planning, which is what we do and I like to focus on, and if you well, say your kids have $50,000 in an investment account, now even if they can't afford to um, put money in the IRA from their salary or from their stipend, they could transfer some of the money from that investment account over to, the, over to their IRA, to their Roth IRA. So keep that in mind. You know, that's thinking, you know, thinking like that. Okay. Uh, nice thing too, when you're earning a low income, special little tax strategy, when your income is very low, you're in the 0% capital gains rate. You say, well, I don't want to sell these stocks and put money in the IRA. I'll pay tax on the sale. You might not. Okay. You got to think about that. I know you weren't. Okay. This is why I have 120, 130 checklist items when I plus my tax checklist, when I work with clients, there's a lot of stuff to remember. You know, you don't want to miss these things. So, um, something to think about. All right, that's so that's so the uh, RMD getting older, the 529, the uh, thousands of college students that will be benefit from from the increased uh, the treatment of stipends and such as as income, small business plans. I find that small. I mean, I think if you if you're in this financial position to do a 401k, $500 credit doesn't mean much to you. Even a thousand or two thousand dollar credit doesn't mean much to you because you're you know the maintenance of the plan and such. I mean, typically, only well-funded companies go through the aggravation of putting in a retirement plan. I mean, the, the administration required is not as big as it used to be in the old days. They've made plans better, but, you know, the, the penalties from screwing that stuff up are so big. It's, it's just scary for small companies to deal with that stuff. So um, I don't know if the credit will make a big difference there, but it's something. And uh, some of the other stuff they're doing, um, you know, they're just kind of cleaning up some some missing things. And with the annuities, that's kind of a big deal, too. I think that as more companies come up with better annuity products for retirement plans, you know, lower cost products with really good payouts and stuff, you'll really see the benefits of, of simplifying that process. We're not seeing it yet, uh, but I think we will. And uh, so just to think about those, are, so those are some of the changes. The SECURE Act, sponsored by uh, Congressman Neal, will likely, will absolutely, looks like it's absolutely going to pass the Senate. Um, big takeaways, increase the age of RMDs to age 72, IRA, IRA RMDs. Students get uh, expanded uh, treatment. They might, some of their stipends and such could be considered um, contrib you know, income that you can use for to determine IRA contributions. We have some flexibility now on increased uh, um, credits on small business retirement plans. We have um, um, certain other little uh, the annuity treatments or annuities inside retirement plans like 401ks are getting uh, a little more they're, they're, they're setting making the uh, the rules around them more more um, under, easier to kind of implement because I think those are going to become a big deal as people you know strive for that, that that income as opposed to just having a pile of money they want that pension like income so just some of the stuff they're doing so that's what they're doing and thanks for watching if you like the video then click like if you want to subscribe, feel free to. I'd love to have you as a, as a subscriber and someone in my little tribe of people we talk to. Any questions, pop them down below or give me a, go to my website, planwithchris.com. Fill out my contact form. You can do that way too. Look forward to hearing from you. Have a great day and thanks again for watching.